So without further ado then, um, I'll let them introduce themselves properly, um, but I'll hand over to Will and Lewis uh, for this lovely uh, session on our final pick. Great, thank you so much, Natalie, and thank you to uh, ME and E and BES for hosting this event. Um, so today we're here to talk to you about uh, our new R package called R Philo Pick. Um, we had a paper come out in ME and E about a month or two ago now, uh, describing the paper, the, the the package, and the functionality in the in the package. But basically, uh, we've developed this R package that we that is used for fetching, transforming, and visualizing. Philopic silhouettes. Um, as I said, this is an R package, and we have a little logo here on the left. Uh, and and we're the two authors of the R package. My name is Will Gurdy. I'm a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History, um, and I study uh, diversification dynamics of marine reptiles right now, but among many other things. And I'm also really interested in, in developing R packages and open science um, and reproducible science. And um, I have here a little plug for one of my other packages called Deep Time, which lets you put uh, little geological time scales on, on your ggplots. Um, and then the other author of the package is Lewis Jones, and I'll let, I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Will. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Lewis Jones. Uh, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Vigo in Spain. And I also work with Will quite a lot in sort of developing packages, um, particularly in the Paleoverse organization, which we'll plug in a second a little bit more. But my research basically focuses on looking at temporal and spatial biodiversity patterns, um, mainly focusing on corals and um, for other sort of Mesozoic and Cenozoic and, you know, and reef organisms too. So I think that kind of wraps us up for introductions. Um, but I just wanted to mention quickly that our Philopic, along with some other packages, is uh, part of this organization we've set up called Paleoverse, with this sort of aim of bringing the paleobiology community closer together. And behind this, we kind of combine like a lot of different resources, such as developing our tools, but also we have resources such as a directory, a Google group, and then um, also a grant tracking system. But if you're interested to know more and you're kind of more interested in the paleo word and world, do check out our website at paleoverse.org. Oh, I think Will wants me to continue. <laughs> okay, so what is our Philopic? So our Philopic is more or less a wrapper of around the Philopic website. And the Philopic website is this online database of um, silhouettes of um, all sorts of different organisms. Um, we see a nice example here. And basically what you can do is you can access this website, which is paid at, um, philopic.org and search for a silhouette of your kind of organism of interest. If you want to just go forward, Will. And before kind of moving on to really about our stuff, I want to kind of do a big shit, um, shout out to Mike Kesey, who is uh, the developer behind Philopic and really drove this forward. And without his sort of efforts, our Philopic just wouldn't exist in the first place. And I guess we should also mention that while uh, Mike is obviously the developer of Philopic and has you know contributed a lot of silhouettes himself, this is a community database and a lot of people are kind of contributing silhouettes themselves as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later with the package, but it's just to say that we should always acknowledge their sort of efforts to this community database of silhouettes. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty, we wanted to highlight some resources available to you for after this, um, this workshop. Um, and so there's obviously the article in Methods in Ecology and Evolution, um, I don't expect you to remember this DOI, but uh, you know, I'm sure you can just uh, Google it. Um, and in that article, we describe kind of the driving force behind the package, um, what we hope it can be used for, and then outline the functionality and a few examples. And we'll be going through in a more in-depth um, way those examples in the article today. Um, and then in addition to that, we have documentation um, and a number of tutorials on our website, or vignettes as they call them in the R world. Um, that's rphilopic.paleoverse.org. Um, 
And if you're from outside of the UK, don't forget there's an extra A in Paleoverse. Um, and so that's where you find all of your reference materials for the descriptions of all the, the, the R functions, um, how to use them examples. And again, lots of, lots of uh, more step-by-step -step examples for how to use the functions. And then um, all of this is completely open source um, on our GitHub. And if you come across any bugs or have any sort of feature requests, you're more than happy to, uh, more than welcome to submit an issue on our GitHub, um, where mostly right now it's just me and Lewis submitting issues to each other. But uh, we'd be more than happy to have issues from other people as well. <clears throat> so what can you do with our Philopic is probably what you're wondering right now. And so we'll briefly go through some of the uh, use cases right now, and then uh, Lewis will talk more in depth about the individual functions. And then after that, we'll come back to these use cases and actually go through step-by-step -step about how you would actually produce um, figures like these. So um, the first way you can use it is just for visual annotation. You can, as Lewis said, pick the image that you want, you can use the R package to retrieve that from the Philopic database, and then you can annotate an existing uh, plot that you already have, like this, where we've put just this, this Adelaide penguin uh, silhouette on top of this, this chart showing bill length and flipper length of various penguin individuals. Another example, an another goose case uh, using a, the same example is you can actually replace your data points one for one with silhouettes. And so here you can see that each of those points from the previous figure has now been replaced with a little tiny penguin silhouette. And you can actually vary these by size and color. Um, and you can even include them in a legend like this. Um, and you might be, you might notice that these all are ggplot figures, but almost all of the same functionality exists to do these same kinds of things in base R in the same R package in R file. Event. Um, you can also, again, replace data points one for one with silhouettes, but in this case, in a ge uh, geographic con context, <clears throat> excuse me. And so in this case, we have uh, paleogeographic occurrences of this uh, Permian uh, tetrapod, and we've replaced those, those points with little silhouettes of that tetrapod um, to perhaps make it more visually appealing to the user, the end user. And then you can also use them to represent taxonomic information. In this example, we have a phylogeny and often you would have at the ends of the tips of this phylogeny, uh, the various taxonomic names. But in this case, this is a pretty broad phylogeny and you probably wouldn't expect most people to know or be familiar with all of those taxonomic names. And so in this case, we replace those with silhouettes that match those taxonomic names. So for example, instead of you know, a cow here, we have an actual silhouette of a cow. And instead of um, you know, Homo sapiens, we actually have a, a silhouette of Homo sapiens. And um, in this case, the background is actually using my deep time package. So just a little plug again for that um, to make a time scale. Okay. Okay, thanks, Will. Um, so we'll talk a little bit now about the functionality which is available in the package, but we'll do this very briefly because we're actually gonna show you a lot of the functionality. Um, so we kind of split this into three different categories. And the first one is about fetching silhouettes. So we have a few different functions to do this. And the first one we have is the get UUID function, which is for getting the Philo pick UUIDs. And what this is, is basically a unique ID number related to each individual silhouette in Philo pick. We also have functions for picking different Philopic images. So in this case, sometimes with a different taxon, um, taxon, you might have, you know, maybe five or twenty images associated with it. So this function allows you to choose from those uh, silhouettes for what you want. We have a function called get Philopic, which is for retrieving the images, which we'll talk a little bit more about in detail. And then we have a whole bunch of other functionality, like for example, plotting getting attribution data associated with each individual silhouette, also for launching a browser to look at Philopic from R, and also for saving the image. And before we kind of move on to the next section, I just want to make clear that on our website, on rphilopic.pediverse.org, if you click on reference, 
we have all sorts of different um, documentation there for describing each function. Of course, you can access this in R as well. But I always think this is a bit more of a visually pleasing way to look at this documentation. So another section we have for our functions is the modifying silhouettes. So we have functions for flipping the silhouettes, for rotating them, and also for recoloring them. And then kind of what you will be more interested in, I guess, is for visualizing the silhouettes. So as Will was saying, we have functionality for both base R and ggplot, and you can basically do everything um, in both of them. So for ggplot, we have three functions. We have the geome philopic, we have philopic key glyph, which is for adding a legend to your plots, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then we also have the add philopic function. Now the equivalent to this in base R is add philopic uh, base, which we'll kind of talk a little bit more now. Um, so Will, is there something you want to add now? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And um, going back to the point of, of our GitHub and, and looking for issues and, and feature requests and things like that, we already have things kind of in the pipeline and, and plans for the future. But of course, these are not um, the full list. And, and we also, again, expect you uh, are happy to, to add other features. But we do, as I showed before, we have little legend icons in ggplot. We're hoping to add those for BASAR in the future. Um, we're also hoping to connect more with the Philopic website so that you can take a list of the, the silhouettes that you're using, save them to what they call on the website, a collection. And then you could actually just have a single URL that you put in say a manuscript and that will then link to the full set of silhouettes that you've used. So we're really excited about that um, for kind of open science purposes and, and for just kind of simplifying the, the, public, the publication process and then also better silhouette searching. Um, we think we've done a pretty good job so far, but there's definitely ways we can improve it by kind of linking with other databases such as GBIF, PBDB, uh, Encyclopedia of Life, and Open Tree of Life. Okay, so that's that. Uh, and so, so now we'll just, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, as you can say why, um, we're just gonna move now on to going through some vignettes. And what we'll start with is sort of a basic introduction to our Philopic to kind of really get you started. Um, so is, is that all good, Will? You've got it loaded, yeah? I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, so uh, this is the source code for one of our exam one of our vignettes, our tutorials on the website. So everything we'll be going through today is also on the website. You can feel free to follow along on the website where it's already pre-rendered, or you can um, download, actually I have, You can also follow along with the actual R Markdown files. I just put a link to them in the chat. Um, and basically we'll just, we'll just be going through some of those to exemplify some of these use cases that I talked about earlier. Okay. Okay, so let's start from the, the bottom then. So, you know, for those who are not familiar with R, the standard way to install packages is using this function we have here called install.packages. And as the package is already on Quran, you can just call our file pick as such here. And um, you can also install the development version of the package. So this is where we have always like our, our most recent commits and updates to the package and um, before we kind of release a new official version. So if there's ever kind of like a, a bug that we fix or whatever that like you've noticed, you know, it's always useful to install from GitHub for that sort of bridging. And then once you've installed the package, you use uh, the standard library function to load uh, our file pick. And I, I guess before we move on, Will, we can just briefly uh, do a plug for ourselves and request that if you do use the package or anyone else's sort of our packages to always kind of cite that those, that just kind of helps us supports us in uh, maintaining packages. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the section, uh, in the session, in the second when we move to it, but, um, you know, it's always important as well to acknowledge those who have contributed the silhouettes 
And we have a function for helping you to do that later. So how does our file pick work? So once we've loaded the R file pick um, package, the first step we need to do is get the unique ID number for each silhouette, which is what I was talking about earlier. And the way to do this is that you provide uh, your taxonomic name of your organism of interest. So as you can see here, we just have this um, argument name and we'll put it in Canis lupus. Uh, in theory, you can also use phylogenetic names um, such as pan mollusca, but we, we do recommend using taxonomic names because it just seems to be a lot more consistent. So once we identify this unique ID number um, for our taxon of interest, we use the function get phylopic, where we just plug in the unique ID number, which is the UUID here, and we assign this to the image object. Now, as I was mentioning earlier, sometimes there are multiple silhouettes for you know, the same uh, taxon. And in this case, uh, we can request multiple UID numbers. So in this line here on 69, we're requesting to get five. Ooh. We're requesting to get five different uh, ID numbers. So this is essentially five unique silhouettes. So how do you pick between all these different uh, silhouettes that we've kind of gathered. So if we just scroll down a little bit, Will, we have this other function called pick philo pick. So in this case, you again can provide the, uh, the taxonomic name, Canis lupus, and we can provide the number of silhouettes that we want to get, which in this case is n equals four. And we can, um, you know, how many of these we want to view at the same time. So in this case, we are saying four again. So this should just generate this sort of panel plot of four um, silhouettes of Canis lupus. Unfortunately, it's not going to show very well here in our markdown, um, but it does work a lot better in the console. But what we end up with is basically a menu where you can select whatever um, silhouette you, know, you prefer. So in this case, we will go with uh, one. And what's important to note here is that when we have this menu option, you also get all the information about the different licenses, which might also be useful for your decision of which license and um, for which silhouette you might want to use, because obviously not all of them are kind of open use. So in this case, let's select one. So as you see, then you get the unique ID number. You also get an output of the silhouette that you selected and also information re relating to like the license and the, and the contributor. So now we've got this image, we can start to plot it. So first we can just generate like an empty plot and then we can use the add file pick base because we're using base R here to add this file pick to your plot. That's showing there, Will. Okay, so this is obviously for this whole code chunk. So this is the first way we do it, where we've basically already got the silhouettes by using the UID. And we now have this object image, which contains all the data relating to the silhouette. But this is a little bit long-winded way of doing it, right? Because first we have to get the unique ID number based on taxonomic name, and then we need to build all these other sort of um, lines of code. But what you can do is kind of skip, um, skip this step of getting the image and just using the UUID straight away. And that's what we're doing here in line 96, right? We're plugging in this ID number and then it just adds it straight away to the plot. But we can skip this even further by just plugging in straight away the taxonomic name, which we have here, name Canis lupus. So as you can see, that's a lot easier you skip quite a few steps, but obviously, you know, we just talked about that there can be multiple silhouettes that exist for uh, each taxon. And in this case, we are always returning the first image available. So for example, if we wanted to really pick which silhouette we want, we have to kind of go through the previous steps of picking uh, the right image.
So we can repeat all this stuff in ggplot2. And this is just to show you again that you know the same functionality is available for working in base R and ggplot. So in case, instead of using add file pick base, what we're using here is add file pick. And again, you know, we can use either just the image object we've created, we can use uh, the UUID, or we can again just use uh, the name. But just remember, whenever you're using the name, it's always taking the first silhouette that is queried. Yeah, and, and actually, an important thing to note is that that can change over time. If something gets uploaded to the Philopec database, it can actually change what the, the first result is. For example, if you know you do canis lupus and there's only canis, but then someone adds a canis lupus, then it'll it'll then be different if you try to repeat your code. So for for reproducibility's sake, often it is better to to do pick or to hard code the the ID numbers or something like that. Yeah, precisely. And then there's obviously a little bit to mention here about uh, you know the amount. So each time we are calling name, for example. We're making a query to the Philopic API. And as you can imagine, if we're fine tuning a plot, like, oh, we want to move it a little bit more to the left or a little bit more to the right. Obviously, this is much slower if you're querying to a, an external API each time. So if you already have the image object downloaded, it's going to be much faster for your fine tuning. Um, but yeah, yeah, just something to keep in mind. So as I mentioned earlier, we also have a bunch of functionality for transforming silhouettes. So imagine you've downloaded, you know, this just plain black silhouette to begin with. Um, maybe you don't like its uh, appearance so much. So what you can do is you can either flip it, for example, and you can do this horizontally or vertically, which in this case, you know, we have horizontal set to true. So this is a horizontal transformation and we have vertical set to false. But you could obviously also do true for both horizontal and vertical, or you know, false for horizontal and true for vertical. And then we also, so you might want to do this, for example, if your, you know, your silhouettes are aligned in different ways. We can also recolor the images. So as standard, most, and by most I mean maybe like ninety nine percent of silhouettes are um, as standard. They come as black but you could change the color of these if you wanted to, um, for example, to make them blue. And you could also do this for the outline. So we have the silhouettes, the fill of the silhouettes is a standard black, but we also have an outline which is standard is transparent. But if you wanted to, you could, for example, make the fill of the silhouette blue and put a red outline if you wanted to. And you can also change the alpha of this. So this is basically like the transparency of the image, which you might want to do in certain cases, for example, if you're stacking things. So here we can see an example of this transformation. And I guess I should note here as well that we have these functions um, separate. And um, so you can transform outside of the plotting environment, but you can also do it within the plotting uh, code. So for example, here we could change so for example, Will now is adding a rotate to this. So this would, you know, rotate the image by 45 degrees. Right. I forgot the uh, argument. So in this case, obviously it's, it's angle. So as you can see here now, this uh, silhouette has been rotated by 45 degrees. So that's just to show that you can do this within, you know, sort of the add file pick function, or you can do it externally. And I guess what we should note here is what you can see is that this silhouette in the middle is, you know, obviously smaller than the other two silhouettes. And that's basically because it's been rotated, but the Y size is maintained between the different silhouettes. Um, so the, the width is automatically set when the original aspect ratio and um, to maintain the original aspect ratio. So, in, you know, looking at this, basically what you can see is the height of each of these silhouettes is the same. But in this case, the one in the middle, of the width has been reduced to maintain the same Y size. Okay. So this kind of brings us nicely onto something um, we both feel quite strongly about, and it's uh, you know attributing people for their, their effort. I mean, I think in Philopic, there's over 8,000 silhouettes. And so a lot of people have contributed to this database, which allows us to 
you know, make some very cool visualizations. And so we thought it was important to make it easy for users of our file effect to attribute um, and people for, the, for their work. So we have the function get attribution to do this. And to do that, you need to use a unique ID number. As I was saying, each silhouette is unique and has a unique ID number. So this is the, the best way to get this and, uh, information about the contributor. So in this case, what we generate is a list and you have information information about the contributor, their unique ID, when the image was created, uh, the image UID, the license that the uh, silhouette is published under, um, which obviously is important for knowing whether you can use this silhouette in certain places, for example, in publications. And to make this even easier, uh, we made a argument in this function called text which basically generates a, uh, a paragraph for you to include in your publications for whatever images you're using. So in this case, you can see here, we basically get a text output saying, you know, organism silhouettes are from Philopic and uh, who, the, who contributed the silhouette. So this should just really allow people to kind of copy and paste this into manuscripts very easily. And I should mention that, you know, in this case, we're just showing with one silhouette. Uh, from one person, but you can also provide sort of a, you know, a vector of all these ID numbers, and then you'll get the paragraph generated for multiple silhouettes. And then finally, just to wrap up this kind of getting started vignette, uh, we also have functionality for saving an image. Um, maybe you want to do this because you want to find tunes for some things in Illustrator, for example. Um, but you know, this is just a simple function called save file pick, and you can save that in a range of outputs, whether it's JPEG, SVG, PDF, um, or, or so on. So I think what we'll do now is move on to what we call the advanced vignettes. And what we'll do is we'll focus on ggplot, because I think this is what most people are using these days. But I would should say that we also have a third vignette which basically does exactly the same, but I think it's in base R. And this is available on our website at rfilopic.pedivers.org. And um, yeah, if you're really interested in looking at more base R examples, I really recommend to go there. So I think I'll pass over to Will now and he'll run us through the ggplot version. Thanks, Lewis. Um, yes, so uh, I'm going to go through the three examples that I mentioned on the slides earlier, and we're going to walk through the steps of how we would build up those figures. And so um, first we of course need to load our package. And in this case, we're also using ggplot to load that package. And then we're also, so that we have some data to use, we're going to use this Palmer penguins package, which includes um, data on individual penguins from Antarctica. And um, and then we'll load their penguin data set. And we're going to, in this case, just subset it to the ones that, that have the sex trait coded for them. But we'll run that real quick. Um, thank you, Lewis. Um, and as Lewis said earlier, there are often multiple images for the same uh, taxonomic name. In this case, you can see that there are well, there might be more than three, but um, in this case, we have these three are the first that come back. And honestly, I don't really care for this one. It's got some weird like turkey neck thing going on. I don't know. And so I actually prefer two. So we're going to choose two in this case. Oh, sorry. Had to uh, shortcut that, but um, so but normally you would have like it showed up here. You would have a little menu, and like Lewis said earlier, you even would be able to see that uh, actually number one isn't uh, in the public domain anyways. So perhaps depending on where you're publishing this in a paper or on a blog or something, you might not even be able to use that one anyways. So even if it did look nice, or um. Okay, and so first we need to kind of draft the figure that we want to include the silhouette in. In this case, I'm just going to make a, a very simple ggplot um, with three panels. And within each panel will be data for one of the species of penguins. 
And uh, for each of those penguin species, we're going to plot their flipper length by their bill length. And so I've added some labels and you know called one of the themes. But really, this is this is the basic plot that we're making, right? We're just plotting this data um, with an xy with x y coordinates. So as you can see, it's a fairly standard um, x y plot in ggplot. Each of those panels, like I said, represents one of these species of penguins. And one easy way that we could incorporate a nice looking silhouette here is we could just add it. As you see, there's kind of like a lot of blank space over in this side of this plot here. I mean, there's also some over here as well, but, but um, maybe we just wanna add a silhouette to the corner of this panel here. So what we do is we set up the X and Y coordinates of where we wanna put it and also specify which panel we wanna put that in. We put that all in a data frame. And then we call the exact same thing that we called before, but in this case, we use geom philo pick to add that the silhouette uh, that we got before. Oh, did I not do it? Wait, did I? We're also going to rotate the, uh, the image by 15 degrees because uh, you might've noticed that he looked like he was kind of stumbling down the street a little bit here. So we're, gonna, we're just gonna rotate him a little. Um, all right, sorry for that. Um, okay, and so we're just going to add that image that we, we just rotated to that location, that X and Y location with a size of 30 in this case. And um, the size here represents the Y axis distance that you want the height to be. And so you'll need to make sure to play with this or kind of tweak this as you make different figures. You're not always going to be able to copy and paste because Different plots, of course, have different y-axis limits and things like that. Um, and we'll get to later about how you can actually have the size represent data itself. But in this case, we're just going to choose 30, which seems like a reasonable height given the y-axis limits here. All right, great. And now we have our little penguin there. Um, if you stretch the plot at all, it will maintain the uh, aspect ratio of the penguin, no matter how you move it or anything. Um, it'll always be at that XY coordinate in the middle. Um, that's an important thing to mention as well. The XY coordinate is the middle of the silhouette um, and the, the, the size is the height as we was talking about earlier. All right, so now we've got our silhouette there. And this actually is probably a, a pretty publishable figure um, in, in any sort of uh, source. But what if we wanna go a step further and like in that example I showed, we wanna replace each, each of these points with a silhouette itself. And actually, that's really easy to do. It's almost like just swapping geom point in this case for geom phylo pick. And so we still have the X and Y coordinates are the same. There's still the bill length and the flipper length. And now all we have to do is just provide the image that we want to use as well. And so in this case, we get the exact same figure. But in this case, now all the little points are changed to little penguin silhouettes. Now, aren't they cute? Um, and so in this way, it's fairly clear that this is data about penguins. And you know that's also, I guess, fairly clear by the fact that you have penguin names here in each panel and probably in the caption of the figure as well. But it adds another layer of, of simplicity and, and understanding to the viewer. Um, and so they might not have to read the caption to get, get at that information. Now, there is actually more information in the penguin data set, and perhaps we want to convey that in some way with these silhouettes. Um, what am I talking about here? So, for example, uh, each penguin also has a body mass in the data set. And so we could represent that by scaling the size of these silhouettes. And so, in this case, all we have to do is, in addition to our XY coordinates, we just add another aesthetic here called size. And we just set that to the body mass of the penguins. All right. ggplot works its magic and makes sure they're all reasonable sizes for the plot. And now you see you've got little tiny penguins over here, and then you get bigger penguins over here. And as you want, you can change the dimensions of this figure here. It's very wide because my screen, but you can make it taller, and then the, the penguins would be a little more visible. Um, but as you can see, there's there's a great difference in the sizes of the penguin silhouettes now. Um, and we can go even a step further 
And in the data set, there's also a sex for each penguin, a male, female sex termination. And so we can go ahead and add that as the fill color aesthetic. Um, and you can ignore some of the other stuff here, but basically we're just making it so that there's a nice pretty legend as well. Um, so we run that. And you'll see that now there's orange and blue penguins. The orange ones here represent the female penguins and the blue silhouettes represent the male penguins as specified in this legend. And this legend is pretty nifty. It shows us that distinction, um, but we can go another step further and in the legend itself, make those silhouettes too. And so as Lewis mentioned earlier, we have this phylopic key glyph function uh, you provide, again, the image that you want to use, and it then uses that as the key glyph in your legend. Um, and key glyphs can be a little finicky sometimes, but it should be fairly straightforward. If you have multiple different silhouettes you want to use, you can just supply them as a list, and it will just go through one by one in your list and replace your legend icons one by one. Um, if your list is shorter than the number of icons in your legend, it'll just recycle it as needed. But let's see what that looks like. And you'll notice that every time I run this, it takes a little bit longer than you would expect to do some sort of just point plot. And that's because it's it's rendering each of these silhouettes um, in all these different places here. Um, but as Lewis said earlier, if you were to call this with, for example, name instead of the image, it would have to go to the phylopic.org database and query every single time I run this. And so in this case, you really do want to save that image first to save you time down the line. Um, and so here we go here. Now we have our legend and we've replaced those colored dots with little colored penguins. And it matches up quite nicely to the silhouettes in the figure. Um, there isn't really a nice way to do this to represent size of the silhouettes yet. We're still looking into it, but I, I, I it's not looking promising. But um, at least for the time being, you can at least represent categorical data. And so there's a great way to use silhouettes to replace data points in figures. You can represent size and, and uh, color to represent categorical and continuous data in your data set. Um, as Lewis mentioned earlier, you can also have outline color in addition to fill color. And so you could actually represent both a continuous character and two categorical characters at the same time, theoretically. Um, and it also makes it, in my opinion, fairly visually appealing. <clears throat> Great. All right. Uh, Lewis, do you want to take the next example? Sure. Yeah, so obviously one thing we're normally quite interested in as ecologists or macroecologists is looking at sort of species distributions. And one thing we can do uh, with our Philopic as well is kind of integrate this with software libraries such as SF and maps to plot sort of a map of species distributions using silhouettes. And um, so what we're going to do here is basically using an example data set from our Paleoverse R package, which is the Tetrapod data set. Um, to plot the occurrences of Diplocalus um, on, a, on a world map. So again, so what we're doing here is just loading the initial libraries that we require for this. So that includes sort of uh, the Pediverse SF and maps. Then we're getting the data from the Pediverse package, the Tetrapods example data set. And we're just subsampling and um, subsetting this down to the Diplocalus um, occurrences. And then what we can do from that is pop the, um, plot their geographic distribution. So the first step we're kind of doing here is just getting the map from the maps uh, package, converting it to a simple features object, um, which is using the SF package. And then we're wrapping it around the date line. So this is not so important when we're plotting sort of longitude and latitudinal maps, but um, when we kind of project this later, this is an important step to avoid sort of some weird things happening with the plots across the date line. So if we just plot this simple one to begin with. And so what we see here is just a simple world map, right? And these are the occurrences of our sort of tetrapod that we're interested in. And in this case, it's just plotting the points. But what we want to do is plot the silhouettes. 
So what we can do then is move on to the next step. And using Geo and Phylopic, we can use our Tetrapods dataset, which has now been um, subset, remember, to our Diplocalus. And we're just going to plot these silhouettes onto our, on the same map. So what you see here is that we're plotting the silhouettes instead of the points. So this is sort of one way of, you know, also visualizing, um, you know, your occurrences, which is a little bit more visually engaging. And as Will was saying um, earlier, that, you know, it's more immediate in terms of what you're looking at, you know, without having to read the, the figure caption. So we can take this a little bit further and we spent a bit of time making sure that our, our file pick is also working well with Gion SF from the SF and GG plot package. And to do this, uh, we did this to make sure projections also work with our, our maps. So in this case, we're gonna build a map uh, in the Robertson projection instead of standard WGS 84. And, you know, plot our occurrences again as silhouettes. So if we just run this code. And what you see there is basically a map again in the Robertson projection with our silhouettes plotted and our occurrences plotted as silhouettes. An important thing to note here is that although we have kind of projected our geographic map, we haven't, you know, warped our silhouettes in the same way. Um, otherwise they'd look a bit weird, right? So we, we maintain the sort of the appearance of our silhouettes. And one other thing to note here, which is I think very important and might catch people out, is that when we convert from sort of a, let's say a, a typical long lap map to a projection, normally map units is in meters, right? So in this case, we need to adjust our size quite significantly in GM Philopic. Normally this might be a value of like three or four, but because now we're kind of using a map projection, which in meters, we need much higher units. So in this case, we have 45. And this, um, you know, if you do use a small size and you get caught out by it, you will get a warning message anyway, um, which will kind of tell you, oh, you might want to adjust this. Um, but just something to keep in mind. You might be like, why are my silhouettes not plotting? And actually it might just because the size is too small and you can't see it. Yeah, we actually ran into, well, I thought we were running into a lot of errors early on when we were testing this, but they were just, so small that you couldn't see them, um, but they were plotting. <clears throat> Great, thanks, Lewis. Um, now we'll go through the last example and uh, this shouldn't take too long and then we'll have time for questions if anyone has them. If you do have questions, feel free to type them in chat or I think they said that we can also have you unmute yourself um, after that. All right, so this final example is using Philopix for tax to represent taxonomic information, which we already kind of have, but in this case, we're going to represent multiple different taxa. Um, and so in this case, it's going to be in a phylogenetic context. We're going to be plotting a phylogeny and then plotting the silhouettes on that phylogeny. And so we load our packages once again. And in this case, we're going to use uh, some data and a phylogeny from the Phi tools, our package. And um, we're going to beforehand get the IDs for images for all of our species. And so we have tip labels in our tree, and we're going to use that to retrieve using the get UUID function, uh, a silhouette for each of them. Now, in advance, we're going to say, well, if you don't have one, we're going to set up this try catch function. You don't need to worry too much about it, but basically if one doesn't exist for that species, we just, we're going to return NA instead. So we'll run that. And this takes a little bit of time because it's going through each of these tips. I think there's about 12 um, querying the Philopic database, returning the first ID it finds. And so you can see that for most of these species, we've returned an ID value for that first um, Philopic silhouette in the database. Now, if you wanted to be more specific, you could use pick Philopic for each species individually. Um, here, we're just getting the first one. It ends up being fine. But you will notice that we have an NA for one of our species, and that's this, this little brown bat, Myotis lucifugus. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and instead of trying to query for that species, 
we'll just query for the subfamily it's in and use a silhouette from that. And so in this case, we'll just replace this NA value in this case with the silhouette's ID value for uh, this subfamily that it's in. Um, and then also we're going to, you could look at each of those. As Lewis mentioned earlier, there's a plot function. And so you could, you know, look at the, um, oh, wait, am I doing this right? Oh, never mind. Don't ignore me. Uh, I'm skipping a step. Uh, you know, you, you could look at what that bore looks like on the Philopic website, for example, and might decide that we don't like it. And so we actually go ahead and replace that um, with a different one. Uh, so here, in this case, we'll show what the pick phyllo pick looks like. Um, it gives you a little progress bar here because if you do say that you want to, for example, you could say you want to see 40 different images, which for most taxonomic names, 40 don't exist. But for very high level taxonomic names, say bacteria, for example, you know, there might be a hundred different bacteria silhouettes. So you could actually look at that and it will show you 10 by 10 images in your plot screen, um, unless your computer is not very good, um, then it might slow down. But otherwise, it will show you all 100 of those, and then you can pick from those. Um, but in many cases, there's just a handful. Um, and so, as I said, I'm not a huge fan of this first Seuss Rafa. I much prefer number two. And so we're going to replace that. And I happen to know that the UUID is this one instead. Now, as we've said before, it's better to get the images first and then plot them in many cases, especially if you're kind of iterating through a figure, you don't want to query Philopic over and over and download these image files over and over and over every time you make a figure. And you know, maybe you tweak one little thing. You don't want to have to query and wait a minute to get your 20 images again. So we're going to go ahead and get the images for all of those in one batch right now. And if you have that ID value, you can just supply it to get Philopic. And we'll just use an L apply function here. All right, now we're going to go ahead and use the ggtree package to plot a pretty simple phylogeny, in this case, using a circular layout. Um, there's also options, of course, to plot tip labels, but in this case, we're going to use the, the Philopix instead. Okay. We go on and we're going to use my deep time package to add a, a time scale to the background of this phylogeny. And there's lots of examples of how to do this in the deep time documentation, so I won't go over it now, but basically you specify, you know, some minor details about how you want it plotted. And then voila, now we have uh, the periods of time from the Ediacaran or the Cambrian here um, all the way to the present, represented by different colored circles. All right. And now we go ahead and um, take our data that we collected earlier, which includes those images that we've now downloaded. We're going to supply that to ggtree. And then we're going to use geom Philopic just like we have before. Uh, it actually already assumes X and Y coordinates for those tips and nodes. So as long as you have them labeled by the tip name, it uh, it assumes all that. You can look at the ggtree documentation for, inf for, uh, for more information about that. So all we have to provide is our image here. We run that. And as you can see, that was very quick because all it's doing is rendering. It's not downloading anything anymore. And you'll see that now we have our tips represented with silhouettes of the species. That looks pretty good, I think. Obviously, you might do some tweaking afterwards. Um, uh, as Lewis mentioned earlier, I'm really particular about which way my silhouettes face. Um, not everyone is. You know, some people might not care. But I actually like them all to face the same way or kind of in a regular way. Um, and so I'm actually going to rotate a couple of them. We're then going to plot them again. And now you can see that um, everything, uh, well, okay. Everything, I guess, on the top half is facing left and everything on the, well, no, I, I must have messed something up. But, uh, oh, no, never mind. I see. I rotated them. I didn't flip them. Sorry, I'm confusing myself. All right. So now you'll see that up here, 
this uh, shark is very, very small. As we talked about earlier, we maintain the height, but um, you can then rotate it to make it much bigger. So in this case, the shark is now bigger because we've rotated it. Okay, beautiful. All right, great. So that's the end of the, the kind of workshop portion. And we'd be happy to take any questions you have, whether it be about the package itself, about how would I do X, Y, or Z. Um, and, and we're happy to, to hang out here as long as need be to, to answer those questions. And thank you all for coming. And thank you again to PES and ME and E for hosting us. Thanks so much, guys. That was awesome. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, if you do, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and kind of shout out. Or if you'd rather not do that, feel free to type a question in the chat and I can read that out for you. Um, I was going to say, I really love the function. I've already been playing with it. Uh, the one for getting the list of references for Philo Pick. Because uh, I'm sure if anyone else here has ever used Philo Pick to make a big figure, you spend at least, you know, just before you submit it, you're like, oh, crap, I got to do that. And you spend ages copy pasting things over. So that is going to be a great relief to many of my students that they can just do that very quickly. Yeah, um, I think people often resort to just not doing it at all because it is so much work. Um, and mm -hmm. so we're hoping that this will also just make it easier and more people will start doing this in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I liked, also liked your your um, point about making sure to cite the authors of R packages and also cite R. Don't forget to cite R. Because mm -hmm. they uh, need more, of course. Yes. Uh, uh, Liana, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I got a question. Thanks, first of all. Uh, that was really nice. I'm going to use it, definitely. Uh, I might have a silly question because um, I've already checked whether uh, my trees are in the database and they are not. <laughs> but so let's say I would um, wanted to see all the trees. So that's not that's not really scientific. It's not all the plants. Or if I just wanted to see all the trees, would there be a search function to do that, for instance? Lewis? Are you frozen? Sorry. Are you... No, so, uh, so you mean trees is in yeah, an actual tree I mean, or I like mean, a phylogenetic tree? Uh, uh, sorry, no. Uh, yeah, a picture of trees or uh, a silhouette, silhouette of trees. So let's say I've checked my main five tree species, for instance, mm -hmm. and they are not in. So, but I would maybe be happy to use a different one, maybe not scientifically accurate, but just if I wanted to portray trees. Right. Yeah. So this herbaceous vegetation, mm. how do I go about looking at all the trees that are there and then trying to find one that looks slightly mm -hmm. all right? Yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to, in these cases, go through like iter iteratively. So, you know, if I don't have my species, I then maybe check that genus level and then I check like family level and kind of go through that to see at what point, oh. you know, I, I feel like I'm happy. I mean, you could also, if you want to skip that, you could kind of go to this higher taxonomic classification in the first place and request maybe like 20 images, 30 images or whatever to kind of like, you know, get a big sort of idea of what's available. Okay. Um, I think one thing we didn't mention as well is, yeah, with the get UUID, I mean, you can request up to whatever. I mean, in theory, you could request the whole database using this uh, function. Um, but obviously, you kind of want to restrict your search to what you're more interested in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would just go through those sort of higher taxonomic classifications. And um, yeah, and, you know, you can also also contribute to the, the database. It's kind of open for anyone who wants to. And it's growing over time. Um, I think now it's almost 9000 silhouettes. But I think they're always welcome. I think tree as a concept in general is just really tricky because it's not a taxonomic thing. Right? Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, I think you'd probably have to choose the couple of example taxa that you know might be all right. Um, yeah. So for example, I, I just uh, did like, I did pick, phylo pick, rate, uh, I, I palm trees. So there's five of them. and so, But you can keep, replace this with your desired uh, family or what have you of, of trees and 
do that. Um, it's also possible that just searching tree here will get you what you're looking mm -hmm. for. Um, often the Philopic website has kind of a broader search, uh, you know, for whatever you're searching. And we're trying to find some sort of middle ground between what we're doing, which is very taxonomic, and what they're doing, which does, does some like fuzzy matching and kind of uh, colloquial name matching. Um, because I don't think you would want, if you search tree in our Philopic, to get this bird back, for example, yeah. which is probably some, I don't know, tree bird or something. That's probably in the name or something. Um, but but you might want that if you're on the website, of course, to, to see how broad these results might be. So um, yeah, obviously the vast majority of the things aren't trees on the website and that probably wouldn't be useful to you, but um, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, I guess it's a good point there as well, Will, that like sometimes common names as well are more sensitive to change than the taxonomic names. Um, sure. Yeah, and, and as Lewis said, you, you can always contribute your own um, and I, that's always like a go-to for people who build databases. It's like, oh, just add your own. And 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 we we recognize that that is often a lot of work for people. Um, and actually, I believe the person who made philopic.org, Mike Kesey, he, I mean, he's very busy, but one of the things he's hoping to do in the future is you can just supply like a JPEG or a PNG of something and it will vectorize it for you and make a silhouette out of it for you in the future. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that might be nice for that. And, and we're hoping that maybe we can incorporate that into the package where you would just say the 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 name of the file you want, it'll upload it for you, make the silhouette and then return the silhouette for you or something, so. Maybe it's a function there for us as well, Will, to develop, to help that process. Oh, yeah, that's what yeah, that's what I was saying, yeah. Maybe then we could, uh, could even get a very personal silhouettes of each on every one of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Thanks. Anybody else have a question? Oh, palms aren't trees. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. I was just enjoying the, we were all being animal, animal people being like, ah, oh, trees. <laughs> I didn't know exactly. that. Not... Anyways. <clears throat> Maybe while we wait, Will, we can discuss a little bit about the difference between SVG and PNGs in the package. We have to. I mean, so, I, guess, I guess it depends. Is that a, a reasonably quick one? Because it is, I know, I've noticed it has gone past four o'clock. Is that a oh, quick explanation or a, uh, a long probably explanation? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> we, we strongly recommend people use the default settings, basically, for most things. There are yes. alternative settings to use uh, rasterized formats of images, but then things can get all pixelated when you when you save the, the figure. So the defaults make everything vectorized. If you don't know what that means, it basically means no matter how much you stretch it, it maintains and doesn't get pixelated. Um, and so we think we strongly encourage people to use that. The file sizes are slightly bigger, I think, in some cases, but it really shouldn't be an issue. Cool. I think if, if nobody has any other questions, I think this just remains to say massive thanks to Will and Lewis for doing this. This was great. It was really interesting and I'm excited to go around and play play a bit more with this package. Um, again, uh, if you're interested in running an ME live or if you have friends who you know wrote papers for us and you think they should do one of these, uh, do let us know. Um, but otherwise, thanks very much everyone and hopefully see you at the next one of these. Maybe while